Hello, everybody, and thank you for being on today's call. Our webinar is going to be titled Introduction to Design Life. My name is Eric Ostergaard, and I am an application engineer with HBM Encode, and I will be your host and presenter for today's session. So let's go ahead and get started. Uh, what I'd like to do first is introduce to you just uh, the agenda for the day. Uh, hopefully, we will be uh, somewhere short of an hour. Uh, giving us a little bit of time for questions at the end, should you have any. As far as the topics, what I'd like to do is first introduce to you the ENCODE product range. We'll talk about the three products we have, and then we'll start to get started with the actual application. Uh, talking about things like its interface, uh, going over some usability features, and then getting into actually creating processes uh, while we describe things like uh, what uh, glyphs are, uh, which glyphs are available to us for a design life process. Uh, and I'll also wrap some things up towards the end uh, with a couple of demonstrations. So let's go ahead and just uh, review a couple of, of objectives that I would have for you today. Uh, for starters, what I'd like for you to do uh, by the end of the hour is uh, to have uh, more familiarity with the ENCODE interface. And uh, that would include how to actually build a process in ENCODE. And then specifically uh, with these processes, how we can perform fatigue calculations on FE models. So in this case, uh, what we're going to do is post-process uh, some stress results we'd solved in, uh, in FE, and then do some predicted fatigue calculations on that. So what we see here are three products. These are the software products that we have within ENCODE. Uh, I'd like to uh, point out these three. Uh, the first two, Design Life and Glyphworks, are both going to be used within the ENCODE environment. Uh, they have essentially tools uh, or groups of tools uh, within each. Uh, we call these tools glyphs, and they are going to be used to build processes. The third one is uh, ENCODE Automation. It is a product that uh, is available in a couple of different flavors. Uh, typically, however, this one is something that you would access via web browser. Uh, so not necessarily in the same application, although it can be, as QuickWorks and Design Life. And uh, let's go ahead and just spend a moment on the next three slides to uh, go into a little bit more detail about each of those three. So for GlyphWorks, uh, this is a tool that is typically used by a test engineer. Uh, in this most simple manner, uh, a test engineer would use GlyphWorks to take some measured test data and do something with that. Now, obviously, uh, the core competency, competency within ENCODE is to do damage calculations. Uh, so that may be the test engineer's objective. Uh, perhaps they've got some string gauge data and they want to do some fatigue calculations. But there are many other things that we can do with this uh, tool as well. What you'll find as you begin to use the software is that it has uh, a graphical interface that is very intuitive to use. You're going to see a lot of drag and drop functionality throughout the software. You will find that we have the ability to handle many different file types. Uh, these files can have many different channels uh, and uh, also many different formats. They can, for example, be in the time domain. Uh, they can be in the frequency domain. Uh, we may even be looking at some statistical results as well. Uh, so in addition to doing some strain gauge calculations, uh, we have some other specialized capabilities for doing damage calculations. Uh, some of this might also be uh, more in terms of doing accelerated testing, uh, looking at things in the frequency domain as well. And we've also got a great deal of flexibility with glyphs that uh, we call scripting glyphs, where uh, if you cannot achieve uh, some type of calculation or process, uh, with the out-of-the-box glyphs, uh, we have the ability to create uh, essentially our own uh, using either the Python or the MATLAB scripting language. The next product is Design Life. This is the one that we'll be focusing on the most in today's session. Uh, but what you'll find again, uh, just like with GlyphWorks, is that we have a graphical uh, intuitive drag-and-drop interface. You'll find that we have a lot of techniques within Design Life that would allow you to very efficiently deal with large FE models and come up with uh, durability results from those. Uh, we have a lot of ways in which we can 
look at uh, the loading environment. That's going to be one of the three main inputs needed for fatigue calculation. Uh, and it can be described in many different ways. We also have a very wide range of fatigue analysis capabilities. Uh, the basics would be things like stress life or strain life. Uh, but we also have multi-axial uh, capabilities. We have specialized tools for welds, both seam welds and spot welds. And we also have a vibration fatigue uh, glyph that we can use to uh, essentially simulate uh, a shaker table. These glyphs uh, have, a, have quite a few properties available to them. Uh, so they are highly configurable. Uh, but right off of uh, the glyph palette, uh, they are fairly simple for a new user to, uh, to bring into a process and set up. And since it is in the same environment, same application as, uh, as GlyphWorks, you can use glyphs from both. Uh, GlyphWorks and Design Life combine them together since they're in a single environment. And this is actually something that's commonly done. In fact, you can see the screen capture in the upper right corner. Uh, where we have some real measured time series data in this, in this example that happens to be used to describe a cyclic loading environment. Uh, it may be that we need to do something to this data. It wouldn't be uh, unusual that uh, we might need to clean it up, remove some noise, or remove some spikes. And in that case, you would be making use of glyphs that would predominantly be used by a GlyphWorks user, uh, although it's going to be in, uh, in something that is to to do predictive fatigue calculations. Um, and then lastly, both with GlyphWorks and Design Life, uh, we've got uh, extensive reporting tools. So if you need to create a report that is formatted, can be shared with other users, other non-ENCODE users, uh, that is something that uh, you can output in a, a PDF, Word document, PowerPoint format, so some type of neutral file format that uh, other people can easily view. And lastly, let's go ahead and take a look at automation. So automation is a web-based uh, tool. It's going to allow you to more efficiently handle large amounts of data. Uh, it could be, for example, uh, data that you are collecting from uh, a fleet of vehicles. Uh, or perhaps it's one test article that's, that's simply being tested uh, many times. So you're, you're generating large amounts of data. It's also a tool that would help you collaborate with other users. Perhaps you've got some colleagues. Uh, all of you are looking at uh, the same data, but maybe looking for different things. Uh, so essentially, uh, automation is going to allow you to manage this data, this engineering data. You're going to be able to create templates that uh, can return uh, tables of data and or results or charts. Uh, and it can also be, be set up to, to run reports. So these, these reports would essentially be processes that you had created in ENCODE, uploaded to a server where automation is installed. And now when large amounts of data come to the server, we can have those reports run on the data coming in and get the answers that we're really looking for. So let's go ahead and get started with um, today's presentation. And we're going to uh, go to this next slide and just talk about how we can actually launch the application. So ENCODE itself is very easy to launch. Uh, if it's on your desktop, go ahead and just click on the ENCODE icon. Uh, the most current release of ENCODE would be ENCODE 9. And what you'll find uh, to start off with is that you're going to be presented with a dialog box that's simply asking you which directory you would like to work out of. So if you've got some, some data uh, that is somewhere local on your drive, you can uh, navigate to your C drive, go to that directory, and as soon as you select the OK button, ENCODE will then go through that directory and look for recognized file types. You can, at any time, while working inside of ENCODE, navigate to a different directory. Uh, this can be done one of two ways. You can navigate to the Tools menu over on the far left and select Set Folder. Or you can click on that same icon right here. It looks like a folder icon above the Available Data window. And in both cases, you're going to see the same dialog box appear, where you can now browse to a different directory. So pretty easy to navigate to other directories and then have access to other P 
pieces of data that you might want to do some analysis on. The user interface is displayed here on this slide, and there's a few key areas that I'd like to point out to you guys just as uh, we get started, uh, particularly for the newer users. Uh, to start off with, uh, I don't want to point out to uh, point out this white area right here. This is what we call the available data window, and this is where we would see all those recognized file types being listed. Uh, so in addition to simply uh, finding those recognized file types, uh, ENCODE is going to organize them for you uh, into branches. And you can see in this particular screenshot, we happen to have an example of an FE model. And we also have some time series data that has been found in a directory. Those are going to be listed here. And any of these files in this available data window can be dragged out onto the workspace and then put into a process. The workspace is this gray graph paper. Uh, area that we have in the middle, and that is where we will build our processes. So you can see that a process has already been assembled in this example. We've got a few glyphs on the far left. Uh, they're acting as input glyphs. In fact, you can see their names. One is titled FE input, and then the other one is titled TS input, which would be short for time series input. And they're going to be uh, connected to other glyphs. Uh, that we have pulled off of the glyph palette, which is over here on the far right. Uh, so a number of different glyph palettes. The one that is currently open is the one titled Design Life. And you can see that we've got quite a few glyphs uh, available to us in this window here. Uh, for example, we have uh, a glyph that would allow us to do strain life fatigue calculations. That's the one that my mouse cursor is close to right now. And uh, to complete the process that we have on this particular workspace, uh, we could go down to this display glyph palette and grab some glyphs that would allow us to do things like display our FP results uh, in a damage plot. Or we can display the same type of data in a in tabular format as well. The last area that I'd like to point out is at the top right here. Uh, we have a toolbar going across the top. This is a dynamic toolbar. And the tools on it will change depending upon the glyph that is currently active. Uh, so as you can see in this process, we have the FE display glyph uh, highlighted. It has a blue banner on it. And what we will see across the top of the toolbar are tools that would allow us to manipulate the way that particular data is going to be displayed. Uh, so we can do things like um, create uh, pick points uh, off of off of our, our damage plots. Uh, we can control the way in which the contours are going to be displayed, uh, do things like full plots. So a lot of the basic uh, manipulation techniques that you would expect to see. So we've talked a lot about a glyph. Uh, let's just clearly define it here, uh, starting with the question, what is a glyph? And uh, that is uh, a box that's going to perform some type of function on your data. Uh, so our processes are going to be defined graphically. Uh, we have glyphs that uh, are connected to one another. They're going to be connected with pipes. We can see an example of that right here. The glyphs also have pads. Any pad that you see on the right-hand edge of a glyph is going to be an output. Any pad that you see on the left-hand edge of a glyph is going to be an input, which basically uh, shows that our data is going to flow from left to right. And these pads are also color coded. So let's go ahead and take a look at what these colors mean. And for the Design Life users, uh, there's going to be a few of these colors that you'll use more than others. Uh, for example, your FE data uh, is typically going to be re represented with uh, a green pad coming off of your FE input glyph. Uh, metadata can also be described with that green pad. A lot of your results will be in multi column format. Uh, so it is exactly that, just very simple uh, columns of data. And some of our inputs might be described either in the time uh, domain or in histogram format. So those are some of the most common uh, colors of paths that you'll see. And what you'll find in most all cases is that uh, the format needs to remain consistent. So if we're going from a blue pad, we're typically going to be going to a blue pad uh, with a couple of exceptions, uh, and one of those being uh, this gray pad down at the bottom. Uh, and a lot of times that is something that uh, might be looking for some metadata, but it doesn't necessarily matter what 
the original format of that data was in, so long as that metadata is, is within that pipe. All right, let's talk a little, about, a, bit, a little bit about glyph properties. Every glyph that we have uh, has properties, and these properties can be accessed one of two ways. We can right-click on the glyph, and from a contextual menu, select properties, or we can double-click on the banner. In both cases, we're going to get some type of a dialog box to appear. Uh, so in the example that we're looking at right now, uh, we see properties that would allow us to manipulate how we're going to filter our time series data. So if any of you guys have worked with measured time series data, uh, maybe you have uh, looked at uh, taking out certain frequency content. Uh, so we can define in this example something like a low pass or a high pass frequency uh, um, uh, filter. Those are all going to be available via pick list. We can see that uh, this particular property with the black down arrow uh, has such a pick list. And then other properties might simply be a numerical value where you can uh, click on this property dialog box for the frequency and then manipulate that uh, as you wish. Once you're de done defining uh, new properties, you'll need to select the OK button. And then you'll also need to remember to rerun your process uh, if you've changed any properties, so that any of your display glyphs that are downstream of that glyph uh, will then be updated to reflect the new changes. So let's talk a little bit about saving a process. Uh, we've so far uh, taken some glyphs, we've brought them out onto our workspace, we've connected them with pipes, and we've essentially defined a template. Uh, this is uh, something that we can reuse we can take new measured data or new FE models. We can bring them into that process and do calculations in the exact same manner that we had previously. So once we've brought those glyphs out onto the workspace, uh, if we wanted to, we could do a simple save operation. Uh, that could be off of the file drop-down menu. So we could go to Save Process. And what it will do for you is save the glyphs pipes, and any of the properties defining those glyphs. Uh, the file extension is going to be FLO. Sometimes you'll hear us commonly call a process of flow. There are a couple of other different ways in which we can save a process. And some of these are pretty popular with the Design Life users. The next one down on the list is something called Save Process for Batch. So if you have an interest in running a process uh, that potentially takes a while to run. This is not uncommon with, with large FE models. And maybe you want to run it uh, as uh, you leave from uh, the end of the day. You can go to your file drop-down menu. You can select Save Process for Batch. And what it will do is save three files. Uh, the first one is going to be the flow file, which is uh, what gets saved in a standard save process operation. It's going to save a script file. And it's also going to save a batch file. The batch file is the actual executable. And that's something that will then launch uh, encode in the background so that uh, it can run the process. Uh, thus, it's not going to be run interactively, uh, where you're, ne you're not necessarily going to be looking at something, uh, looking for data to appear in the display. The batch is going to have instructions inside of it to open up this particular flow file that got saved with it. And it's going to use information in the script file uh, as instructions as to how that batch is going to be run. Uh, the batch file and script file are both ASCII files, so they're fairly easy to open up with a notepad editor and read and then uh, also uh, manipulate. You can easily add lines to it. Uh, and get a bit more sophisticated with how your processes are going to be run in batch mode. The next process, or the next way in which we can save a process, is something called Save Process with Data. Uh, this is also something that's pretty popular with the Design Life users, uh, because there are a lot of times where you run a process, uh, it's at the end of the day, uh, you'd like to be able to look at the results that you are currently seeing the following day, uh, but if you had saved it uh, with just the generic save process method, you'll find out that we didn't save any data with it. Uh, so in this particular example, it's just a little bit further down on the file drop-down menu, save process with data. 
uh, we will actually save what is in the input and the results uh, or in the display glyphs. And then lastly, uh, we have a new option available to us that's something called package process and data. And essentially what it does is saves the flow file for you and then bundles any of the input files, uh, which could be things like your FE model, uh, maybe a, a material, uh, and perhaps some time series data defining your loading environment, and bundles all those together in a zip file for you, uh, which would make it much easier for you then to uh, email to a colleague if they're trying to uh, take a look at the same information, want to run the same process as well. All right, so once we have built the process, uh, we need to run it so that we can see our, our answers. And the easiest way to do that is to simply click on this blue triangle. It's going to be on a menu towards the top of your, your uh, user interface. And that's going to run the process. Uh, as the process is run, you'll see in process lights flicker on your glyphs. And uh, that's just showing you which glyph is currently running computations at that moment in time. Uh, for many of the demonstrations that I'm going to do today, the models are fairly small, so those lights don't don't uh, flicker very uh, very long, uh, which may not always be the case. And then lastly, we have the diagnostic window uh, that, uh, if you want, uh, sometimes it's used for debugging purposes. We can have that opened up, and uh, we can look at things like how much time was required for each of the glyphs in our process to run computation. All right, let's take a look at some usability features. Uh, if any of you guys are uh, savvy Microsoft Office users, uh, you know the shortcut keys already. Uh, so things like undo, redo, cut, copy, and paste, uh, those are functions that are, are features that are going to be available throughout ENCODE. Uh, and the hotkeys are going to be the same ones that you're already familiar with. Very useful if uh, you want to, for example, window in a group of glyphs in your process. Uh, you can then hit the uh, Control C button for copy. You can then select Control V for paste, and you can paste uh, those copied glyphs uh, to another location in your process. We have the ability to rename our glyphs. Fairly simple. Uh, you can uh, right click on a glyph and select Rename from the contextual menu. And that becomes fairly uh, helpful whenever you're starting to build processes that are, are getting pretty big and uh, contain quite a few glyphs in them. We have uh, an F9 feature. Uh, if you select the F9 button, it's going to toggle the visibility of your available data and your glyph palettes. Uh, if you select it one more time, they come back. And uh, that essentially gives you a little bit more real estate to work with in your workspace. Uh, very helpful whenever your processes are getting bigger. Uh, same kind of idea, uh, we have a workspace zoom tool. Uh, that is on the toolbar across the top. And uh, you can slide this bar back and forth to zoom in and out on your workspace uh, and see more of your process. All right, so what I'd like to do at this moment is uh, jump into ENCODE and uh, put together a really simple process for you guys so you can see uh, how the glyphs are uh, brought into the workspace, how we can connect pipes uh, and save that process. So let me go ahead and jump into ENCODE. Uh, so again, this is the ENCODE interface for those of you guys who are completely new to it. Uh, the white area on the left is our available data. I've already navigated to a directory. Uh, this directory that, uh, that I navigated to happens to have an Excel spreadsheet in it, happens to have an FE model, and also some sample time series data. What I'd like to do here is just grab some time series data. I'm going to drag it out onto my workspace. You'll see that it automatically places it into a time series input glyph. I can check this display box here uh, and also enlarge my, my display so that I can take a closer look at my measured data. And what I can see is we've got uh, two channels of data here uh, collected for about 94, 95 seconds uh, in duration. What I'd like to do is, in this particular example is take a look at the frequency content of my measured data. So we have uh, a glyph palette over on the right called basic DSP. Now that's uh, short for digital signal processing. So we've got a lot of glyphs on this palette here. 
that do some type of computation to our digital data. And one of them happens to be called frequency spectrum. So what I'm going to do is drag that out onto uh, the output pad of my time series input glyph. And as I do that, it will automatically create a pipe for me, showing, the, showing me that my data will be going from left to right. And then lastly, I'd like to grab a display glyph. So in this case, I want to grab something fairly simple. I'm going to grab an XY display that will just plot um, amplitude versus frequency. If I want, I can go into my frequency spectrum glyph. I can double click on the banner and I can manipulate properties if I want to. Uh, for example, from this pick list, I could choose uh, any one of these output types. And once I've defined the properties that I want to use, I now click on the Run button, and we now have some results in our XY display. So if I enlarge this plot and uh, perhaps manipulate the way in which the Y axis is displayed, I can change this to a log scale. I can now look at the frequency content of both of, of both channels in my time series data. All right, so what I've done is is uh, spent just a little bit of time building a very sh very small, simple process. It just has three glyphs. Uh, I can save this. Let me go ahead and click the Save button. Uh, as you can tell, I've already done this a few times. So uh, we'll just give it uh, the name Sample 3. And what I want to show you now is uh, how you can take this process and reuse it. Uh, so essentially, this process acts as a template. You can uh, close this out. You know, perhaps it's the end of the day, you're getting ready to go home. You come back the following morning, you want to do uh, frequency analysis on some new measured time series data. So what I can do is go to the process that I had created earlier. When I bring it out, you'll see that my display and input glyphs are empty. I can take some time series data, and we could pretend that this would be maybe some new measured time series data, drop it onto my time series input glyph. You'll see that uh, it currently says one test is, is in this glyph. Uh, we could drag multiple ones in here if we wanted. We can display it, and we can run that process again and perform frequency calculations the exact same way that we had defined the previous day. So that's uh, the gist of putting a process together, uh, the concepts of uh, promoting standardization with these, these templates that uh, are going to allow us to perform repeatable uh, calculations. All right, let's go ahead and jump back into our presentation and uh, focus a little bit more on design life and uh, ultimately get to uh, a demonstration at the end where we can see how a design life process is put together. So the first thing that I'd like to introduce to you is something that we call the five box trick. Essentially what this describes is a very generic process that is required to perform fatigue calculations. So this is uh, the minimum requirements, uh, whether you're doing fatigue calculations by hand or with a computer, that describe for you, uh, in this case, three inputs. Uh, we need to describe geometry, which for design life is going to be your FE model. We need to describe the fatigue properties of the material. Uh, so we're going to actually go to a material library inside of ENCODE. And then lastly, we need to define our cyclic loading environment. Uh, so how are these loads varying? Uh, and we have a number of different ways we can describe that. All three of those inputs are going to be combined into this box in the middle, where we actually count the cycles of stress on all of the nodes in our FE model. We're going to determine how much damage each one of those cycles causes, uh, sum them up linearly using Miner's Rule, so some very basic uh, concepts in fatigue. And in the end, we're going to output some type of result. Uh, it could be a, a damage plot, for example. For the FE input, uh, the glyph that we're going to be using to bring our FE models in, uh, we support a number of different file types. Uh, you can see those right here. So we essentially support all of the major FE tools, uh, ANSYS, Abacus, uh, Nastran, uh, IDEA, Celestina, and also ProMechanica. The material uh, is 
something that you can access with the Material Manager that's available on this toolbar all the way over on the far left under Main Menu. These materials are user definable. Uh, there are two material libraries that come with installation of Vincode, so you guys will have access to some materials, uh, but you can create your own as well. And this tool right here allows you to uh, navigate through uh, the materials in your database, view them graphically, or perhaps you can click on this tab here and look at the uh, material properties in tabular format. Uh, so a number of different ways in which we can view our data. Uh, also, a number of different ways in which we can define our material data as well. And then our loading. Uh, like I said earlier, we have a lot of ways in which we can describe our loading. The demonstration that I'll do at the end today, I'm going to show you two different loading types. I'm going to start off with something that's very simple. It's something that we call constant amplitude. And I'm going to define one sing simple load cycle. Uh, but then I'm going to make it a little bit more complex and use real measured data to define my loading environment, and that would be something called uh, time series. Uh, but we have a number of different uh, loads that we can also make use of, things like time step. Uh, this particular load type is one where we've actually solved for all the steps in FE. Uh, it works really well for uh, fairly short uh, transient events. Um, we have the ability to create duty cycles. Uh, this essentially allows us to create a sequence of other loading types, uh, commonly one of the first three, either constant amplitude, time series, or time step. And then we can also define how many repeats. Uh, so for example, if you're in the automotive industry and you have acquired uh, some road load data on, on one lap of a particular track on a proving ground, we can now create a duty cycle and we can put multipliers on that lap. So now we can, uh, we can for example, simulate uh, the, the loading environment for 100 laps on a particular uh, track. Uh, that might then be followed up by uh, a number of laps on a different track. Uh, two last loading types. Uh, we have one called vibration. That's going to allow us to describe our loading environment in, uh, in the form of a PSD or swept sign. And then we have the last one called hybrid. This is going to allow us to calculate stresses through a combination of load types. Uh, a lot of times, uh, if you're trying to do some thermal simulations, this might be the way to go, where in addition to, uh, to stresses varying with time, you might also have some temperature uh, uh, evolution in your, in your results as well. All right, the middle box in our five box trick uh, is going to be the fatigue calculation glyph itself. The image that we have at the bottom shows all of the glyphs that we have in the Design Life glyph palette. Uh, but uh, I'd like to just focus on, on a few of the, the more commonly used ones. Um, we have stress life, uh, so that's going to allow us to do uh, fatigue calculations that uh, are perhaps high cycle fatigue. We have strain life, uh, as the second one that would allow us to do high cycle or low cycle fatigue. And below that, we have uh, some specialized ones. We've got two welds, one for spot welds and seam welds, both of those being stress life based, but uh, with a couple of uh, extra things in them that would allow us to take results and, uh, and perform fatigue calculations along a, a weld line or on spot welds. At the very bottom, we have vibration uh, fatigue. That one is also stress life based. And then we have one called virtual strain gauge. Uh, a bit different than the others in that it doesn't actually perform damage calculations. Uh, but what it does allow us to do is place a virtual strain gauge anywhere on our FE model and then apply a loading environment. A lot of times this would be in, in the time domain. And then we can output the stress or strain histories from that virtual strain gauge. Uh, so seen a lot of people use this uh, to do correlations with real measured strain gauge data um, and uh, have uh, quite a bit of success with that as well. All right, we're getting to the last box in the five box trick, and that's going to be actually uh, displaying the results. We've got quite a few different options available to us. Uh, we have the ability to display 
our results uh, on a contour plot. Uh, so now we would be looking at uh, a plot of either damage or life, That'd be the most common type of results to look at. Uh, or we could possibly look at that data in uh, a table as well. Uh, obviously, you wouldn't want to look at every single uh, nodal result in the table. Uh, that could be quite long. Uh, but maybe uh, we've done some things where we've shortened the list and we've really focused in on some critical areas on our FE model, uh, reduced it to maybe uh, 100 rows or less uh, in a table. And in that case, it might be efficient to, uh, to take a look at things in a table. All right, so let me go ahead and jump back into ENCODE. And uh, what I'll do now is actually build a process for you that uh, does fatigue calculations on an FE model. So let's go ahead and clear out the process that I created earlier. And what I'm going to do now is drag some new data out. The first thing I'm going to start with is this FE model. So I'm going to drag this out. It happens to be uh, an abacus model, uh, but uh, it could have been uh, an ANSYS or an ASHRAN uh, file. Uh, they're all going to uh, be treated the same way, simple drag and drop operation. I can check this display box, and I can also enlarge the glyph by clicking on the maximize button. And here you can see a very simple structure. Uh, we've got a cylinder with a reduced section in the middle. And what I'd like to do is, is just show you the stresses that were solved for in FE so you can get an idea of the type of load cases we're, we're dealing with. That can be accessed by uh, double-clicking on the banner, going into the properties, and under this FE display tab, I can now view the load cases. This particular example has two load cases. Uh, load case one is titled Vertical Z Load. Let's go ahead and click on that one and view it. What we can see is that our FE model has been constrained in the upper right end, and uh, we've applied a bending load in the lower left end, and this bending load happens to be uh, a unit load, so we've applied one newton. That's uh, something that tends to make the calculations in design life a bit easier, uh, but it's not an absolute requirement. The other load case, let's go ahead and go to that one, is one titled X moment. And if we look at the stress distribution here, we can see that we've now applied a moment to the end of our cylinder, and we're trying to twist the cylinder. So the very first example I'm going to show you is uh, just going to make use of the first load case. I'm going to describe a very simple uh, cyclic load that is going to bend that cylinder back and forth. Uh, but as we get a little bit further into the process, I'm going to uh, eventually describe my loading with real measure data, and I'm going to make use of both load cases. We're actually going to uh, do something called linear superposition. But before we get ahead of ourselves too much, uh, let's just focus on the first simple example. The next thing I need to do is navigate to the Design Life Glyph Palette. I'm going to perform uh, some Strain Life calculations. So let's drag that glyph out and connect it to my FE input glyph. I'm also going to grab some display glyphs. So let's grab an FE display, place that right there. You can uh, make it a little bit bigger by dragging its corner. And I'm also going to grab a data value display glyph. This is going to be a glyph that shows me all my data in a table. Now, I still need to define two more inputs. I've defined the geometry so far, but I still need to define the material, because uh, we don't necessarily know that. We are just processing the results from our FE calculations. And I need to define the loading. So let me go ahead and right click on my fatigue calculation glyph. I'm going to select Edit Material Mapping. And what this does is opens up a dialog box that gives me access to uh, materials in my material database. I'm going to go ahead and grab an aluminum alloy and drag that up onto my FE model. My FE model is very simple. Uh, it only has one, uh, one property set in it. Your FE models might be more comprehensive. You might have multiple sets. Uh, whether they be material sets or property sets, they can be displayed here in this list. And uh, that also means that if you'd like, you can assign unique materials to different sets in your FE model, as well as controlling things like uh, surface finish or any KT values uh, on uh, a set-by-set -set basis. 
All right, uh, the last input that's required is going to be our loading. So let me right click once more and I'm going to select Edit Load Mapping. And here in the upper left corner, we have a drop down menu to define the load type. I'm going to start with the simplest form called Constant Amplitude. What it does is shows me in the left hand side all of my available FE load cases. By default, it's brought both of them over. Uh, what I'd like to do though is just focus on one of them. That's going to be this vertical Z load. So let me go ahead and uncheck this auto configure. And I'm just going to move my moment load case back to, to the left. Uh, that's going to allow me just to focus in on this one load case here, uh, my bending load. And what I would like to do is define a load cycle uh, large enough to produce some damage so that we can actually uh, take a look at some results in our damage uh, plot and uh, and see some see some uh, numerical values there. So what I need to do is actually scale this up. Uh, remember, in FE we had applied a load of one newton. It was a unit load. And what I'd like to do is scale that up uh, by 13 uh, and also scale it down by negative 13. So essentially what I'm doing now is defining a cycle that will bend this cylinder uh, with a load of 13 newtons. And then I'm going to do fully reverse bending to negative 13. So that's going to be my cycle. And that, in turn, will produce stress cycles on all of my nodes, which we will then apply to our fatigue curve and determine how much damage is caused by that stress cycle. All right, so we'll select the OK button. And now what we can do is click the Run button. And we now have some results. So let's go ahead and enlarge our Epi Display Glyph and uh, take a look. Because we have uh, essentially a fully reversed uh, load cycle uh, that uh, is about zero, uh, and we have a nice uh, symmetric uh, load about a symmetric uh, piece of geometry, we're going to see that the damage distribution is going to be the same on both sides. The units that we're currently looking at, we can see in the legend is damage. Uh, but if we'd want, we can uh, go to the properties and display that in terms of life. That's, uh, Sometimes people prefer to look at it in terms of life. And now what we can see is that the minimum life, uh, which is going to be in this hot spot right here, that's pretty much where we would expect to see uh, a crack to initiate first, right in that uh, shoulder, is 1,163. So essentially what that means is I could take this shaft and I could bend it back and forth a little over 1,000 times plus minus uh, 13 newtons before we would expect to initiate a crack. Uh, if I minimize this and maximize my data value display, we can uh, see all the exact same information, uh, but in tabular format. Uh, we have uh, the first column right here for our node ID. Uh, we have a row for every node. And as you go across, you can see uh, here are uh, our life results in the very last column, uh, they're already pre-sorted uh, in increasing order. Uh, we also have column six, here's our damage results. Uh, so according to uh, the classic definition, uh, life and damage, they're just inversely related. All right, let me go ahead and uh, take the second step, and that is to, uh, instead of defining our, our loading environment with a very simple single cycle, I'm going to use some real measure time series data to do that. And I'm actually going to make use of the time series data we saw earlier. Uh, so let's just maximize this and take a quick look. The first channel is called vertical Z load, and the second channel is called X moment. Each of those channels will be paired up with the two load cases that we'd solve for an FE. So there will be moments in time where we will be scaling the stress states on uh, load case one up to, uh, in this case, somewhere around 13 newtons. Those are some of the largest peaks that we're seeing. We're going to scale down uh, some of those, those load cases to uh, negative 13. So in fact, the largest cycles that we're seeing here are very similar in magnitude to the single cycle that I had described just a moment ago. But there's something else going on at the exact same time, and that is uh, measured data on the moment as well. And you can see that these two don't necessarily uh, behave perfectly in unison. So what we will be doing is scaling up the stress states of both load cases. We've got the full stress tensor. 
and we will then be adding those scaled uh, stress states together uh, for linear superposition and that then is going to create the stress history uh, that we then do rainfall cycle counting on to determine its cyclic content and then miner's rule uh, for determining damage caused by each of those cycles. So you can imagine you know, in this little stretch right here, we're going to have extremely small cycles, if any at all. And that's probably not going to produce much damage. Uh, in this area here, we've got uh, some higher amplitude loads. Uh, those will probably produce some damage. We need to be able to pipe this time series input glyph into my fatigue calculation glyph. So let me go ahead and go back to load mapping. I'm going to change my load type back to time series. And as soon as I do that, you'll notice that a blue pad appears. And now I can create a pipe between the two. And just so that you can see how those are, are, are mapped together, let's go back into load mapping. And you can see in the upper left, we have all of the available load cases in FE. In the lower left, we have all of the channels of time series data. And then those are going to be combined in, uh, on, on the right-hand side of this property box. Before I run this, there's one last property I'd like to change, just so it runs a little quicker. Uh, and that's something called peak valley slicing. It's just a way to uh, reduce the number of data points in my time series data that are used in the calculations. And now I can click the Run button, and we should get some answers. So let's go ahead and just maximize this. And what we see is that um, the damage distribution is fairly similar. Uh, that first load case, the binning load case, happens to be the most dominant one. And now what we see is a minimum value in, uh, in our hotspot of 311. Uh, so what that means is the 95 or 95, 94 seconds worth of measured data can be repeated a little over 300 times before we would expect to initiate a crack in this area right here. And that actually makes sense if you start to really look at the cyclic content of our measured time series data, because there's about three large cycles that go from 13 to negative 13. Uh, so we would expect to see our, our minimum life results to be about a third of what they were earlier. All right, let me go ahead and jump back into uh, PowerPoint. And we'll just start to uh, review uh, what we just saw in the demonstration. The design light demonstration that I did, I did for you in two steps. Uh, the one was, uh, step one was just to uh, come up with a very simple load case. We used constant amplitude. Uh, we only took into consideration that first load case, the bending load case. And the life was going to be defined by a single cycle. That's the 13 to negative 13 newtons. In the second step, we got a little more complex. Uh, we used real measured uh, time series data to describe our, our cyclic loading. Uh, we happen to have two channels. Those corresponded with two load cases. Uh, both of those load cases were considered. Uh, we scaled them up based on the peaks and valleys seen in our measured time series data. We used linear superposition to combine them. And then that creates the, um, the, the stress history uh, on a node by node basis that we use to come up with damage calculations. And life in this particular example was defined by repeats of the entire uh, time series event. So we're getting to the end here. Um, just uh, wanted to review the objectives. Uh, hopefully everybody uh, by uh, sitting in on this webinar today has become a bit more familiar with the ENCODE interface. Uh, hopefully you guys uh, have a much better idea of how we can build a process. We saw a couple of simple examples today. And then uh, the last example was doing fatigue calculations on FE models. So hopefully everybody has, has learned a little bit about that as well. And uh, that actually concludes today's webinar. Uh, so what I'd like to do is uh, thank you guys for being in attendance today. And uh, in a moment, I'm going to uh, open up a polling session for you guys, uh, as well as um, allow you guys to ask any questions as you want. Uh, that you may want. And uh, also, it's just worth mentioning that uh, this is a recorded webinar. So uh, if you have other colleagues that are interested in seeing this, uh, please feel, feel free to, uh, to mention this to them. Uh, these recorded webinars can be accessed directly from our website. 
Uh, we have uh, this particular topic, which is a, an introductory level topic, as well as quite a few other topics that uh, are more advanced and, and start to explore some of the more um, sophisticated tools that we have in the software. So again, uh, thank you very much for your attendance. And uh, with that, uh, we'll be wrapping up today's uh, webinar session. Thanks again.